All right, today, inshallah, we're going to start talking about giving, relinquishing, yani, releasing your hold on something, spending, like, because you have to support your wife and kids, for example, or because of other monetary obligations you have, you might need to spend money to do those obligations. And supporting the wife, the children who didn't reach puberty, and others. Wealth is judged on a daily basis, not a yearly basis. Non-Muslim way, wealth is judged on a yearly basis. You ask a person, how much you make? He says, oh, I, I make 35. He means 35,000. I make uh, 75. He means 75,000 per year. Religiously, wealth is judged on a daily basis, starting at dawn. So if you're wealthy at Fetcher time, you're wealthy that day. Or if you're poor at Fetcher time, then you're poor for that day and you might be rich the next day. You could be rich one day and poor the next day. The wealthy one or the rich one has enough money for the rest of a normal lifetime. That's his definition. Which determines if you're wealthy, if you have enough money for the rest of your life. The poor miskin finds more than half of what he needs for the day, but not all. So if you're miskin, you're poor, but... You cover some of what you need. If you needed $10 a day, you might cover seven or eight, for example. And you're still poor then, because you don't have everything you need. And the impoverished faqir cannot find half. If you're faqir, you can't even get half of your daily needs. If you needed 10 per day, maybe you can get two or three. The bankrupt is the one whose debts exceed his wealth. As you have come to know, Yanni, we already covered that. The one whose debts exceed his wealth. But he won't be barred from using his own money without the verdict from a Muslim judge. One might be obligated to give or pay something just for having it. Just merely because he has it and, and other conditions are fulfilled along with that. Yeah, and he's starting with the fact that he merely has it and then other conditions along with that, like how much of it he has, how long he had it. He would be obligated to pay it, to give it to someone else, to pay it, to get, to relinquish it. For camels, cows, sheep and goats, gold, silver, staple crops like rice, wheat, barley, corn, dates or raisins. Those are what's subject to zakah. He may have to pay zakah if all the conditions are satisfied. Zakah, whose eight recipients are named in the book. He pays the zakah to any of the eight recipients mentioned in the Quran. Inna sadaqatu lil fuqara'i wal masakini wal amilina alayha wal mu'allafati kulubuhum wa fir riqab wa fir riqab wal gharimina wa fi sabili illahi wa bini sabil The obligatory charities are merely for the poor, the impoverished, the zakah worker, or the zakah workers, those whose hearts need to be reconciled, uh, the slaves who want to buy their freedom, those who have debts, the stranded travelers, and the volunteer fighters. One may also have to pay zakah for his trade, as mentioned. For his trade means when he sells something for a profit, and with that profit, he buys more product to sell it for a profit. And then he keeps flipping like that for an entire lunar year. Let's say he started on the first of Ramadan. Then when the next first of Ramadan comes, he has to, if all the conditions are fulfilled, pay the zakah for being a trader. As well as for the Muslims he supports, that he's obligated to support, he would have to pay zakah if he can afford it. For all the Muslims he's obligated to support his non-pubescent children, any wives he has, any Muslim slaves he has, his uh, Muslim parents that he's obligated to support. You're not obligated to support your siblings, though, or your other relatives when they're poor. When we say you're not obligated to support them, we're not saying don't give them a charity or something. But we're saying you don't have to take them in your home, provide them with clothing, provide them with food on a daily basis because he's your brother. But if you had poor Muslim parents, you do. 
You have to support them. And you can't tell them to go work even if they're able to. Your Muslim wife, you have to support her even if she has more money than you. Your non-pubescent children, you have to support them from your own money if they don't have money. As the father that is. The father has to do that. A husband must support his wife when she makes herself available for him. That means she doesn't forbid him from enjoying her body when it's lawful for him to do so. And she's not a runaway. She fled her husband, ran away from him. Or otherwise just staying away from him. Like she doesn't come to his house when he tells her to. Rather, she makes herself available to him. If he calls her, if he summons her, she comes to him. Even if, for example, her family kept her away from him, but then she ran away and came to him. That means she made herself available to him. So she'll be obligated, he'll be obligated then to support her. Even if she's a slave or a disbeliever, he has to support his wife. Of all his dependents, she is the only one whose support does not depend on needing it. Of everyone, the man is obligated to support. The wife is the only one whose support is not dependent on her needing it. Like we said, she could be wealthier than her husband by many times. She still has a right to lodging and clothing and food in accordance with his monetary status. If he's rich, he provides for her like rich men. If he's poor, he provides for her like poor men. If he's middle class, then like middle class men. The others, their support depends on their need. So let's say you have some children who didn't reach puberty. How much you have to provide for them in accordance with their needs. So you'll buy them clothing. Those your clothing, you own them that they wear. As opposed to your wife's clothing that you bring to her. You give that clothing to her and then she owns that. But those children, or anyone else you support, when you provide them with clothing, that's your clothing unless you let them have it. When you have to get them some new clothing, well, when they need it, there's no particular time. How much food you have to give them, eh, what satisfies them, there's no particular amount. So what they do with child support is unjust on many levels. Because it's not even a condition for a man, let's say he's separate from the mother of his children. It's not even a condition that he gives her cash money. It's enough for him to bring the clothing for his child, the food, the medicine, whatever, and not give the mother any money in particular. And that's not based on how much money he makes. So what do the non-Muslims do? They will say, how much money you make? Ah, you make this much money? You're a millionaire? Uh, then we're going to take out of your money every month so many thousands of dollars for your child. That's unjust. Your child doesn't need thousands of dollars every month. And even to say every month, religiously doesn't have a particular time limit. He just has to fulfill their needs. So the wife's support is specified, it's determined, predetermined, and based on his wealth, like we said. Based on his wealth means if he's rich, he gets her the clothing and the lodging and the food of the rich. If he's poor, he gets her those things like the poor people. If he's middle class, then the middle class people. Because Allah says, let the wealthy person spend from his wealth, etc. Till the end of that ayah. Any, and anyone who his money was tight, then he pays what he can. He provides his wife with suitable lodging. So it has a bathroom, has a kitchen. It's not like a cardboard box between the houses. That's not suitable lodging. He does not have to own the lodging because he's not obligated to transfer its ownership to her. 
But he does give her ownership of the dominant zakah applicable fresh staple food of the town. Zakah applicable. Like rice, wheat, corn, raisins, dates. Whatever is the zakah applicable staple of the town, he's obligated to get her that. Fresh means not other than fresh. Prepared for eating means not raw. So that means then who has to do the cooking? And this is Shafiri school. He does because he doesn't give it to her raw. And she's not obligated to support him. So it's not her obligation then to bring the food, nor to cook the food, nor to give it to him. It's his obligation to bring the food and cook the food and give it to her, and he can feed himself. Although the wives usually are generous to their husbands in this regard. Some scholars said, Yani, they believe that this is the judgment that was existing since the time of Adam, what I'm telling you. In all the religious laws, they said, since the time of Adam, the women have been generous to their husbands, charitable to their husbands by this treatment of preparing food for them and feeding them, etc. And he has to give her what people eat with bread. That depends on the culture. Might be cheese, might be olive oil. If there's more than one kind in the town, he gives her what agrees with his status. He offers her meat and the fruit of the season occasionally. So it means there's not some particular time there. From time to time, he's going to give her meat. From time to time, he's going to give her fruit. How are you going to gauge that? You're going to stay safe. You're going to do it such that you're not afraid that you're sinning. So let's say you gave her meat. Let's say the next day you gave her meat. Then let's say uh, the next day you didn't give her meat. Then maybe the next day you didn't give her meat. Then you might say, huh, it's been two days without meat. Mm, let me just go ahead and get her some meat. For example. And like that for the fruits. In a way that you don't become negligent. However, if on any day she accepts eating with him in the normal way, meaning like how families eat together, he does not have to give her the specified amount on top of that. So what we're talking about as far as her right is something that's separate from some normal family living condition. We're talking here strictly business. Like they say, business never personal. This is not personal here. This is business. That's your wife. You owe her a certain amount of food every day. And you owe her a certain amount of clothes every year. So, if you want to go strictly business, then you can give her her specific amount of food every day. And that's her food. And there's no problem with that. But if she eats with him like people normally eat together, then his obligation is fulfilled without him also giving her her specified amount that she would get on a strictly business tip. He clothes her with what the religious people of his financial and social status clothe their wives, rich, poor, or middle class, offering her clothing every hot and cold season. So that's twice per year. Something that covers her body from her neck to the ground. A pair of pants to wear under the dress. And something to cover her head and her neck. With the needed accessories that go along with that. Like thread to sew if she needs to fix a hole or a tear. And something to wear on her feet. And the underpiece of the scarf that keeps her scarf from sliding back and forth. That's obligatory on him. In the winter, she gets a coat or a cloak. 
And she also deserves a seat to sit upon. A rich person provides a carpet for the winter and something thinner for the summer. A poor person provides a carpet of poor people. And for the summer, a mat. And she gets something to sleep on, like a mattress. So, in accordance with his monetary status. So if he's a poor man, he might get her some sort of mattress. If he's a rich man, he might get her, you know, something that's decent. A pillow and a cover or a blanket. Depends on the season. So warm season, he'll get her a sheet. Warm in the cold season, he'll get her a blanket. She gets utensils for eating, like a platter, a plate, a jar, a cup, a spoon. I was told I pronounced this wrong last time. A ladle. Is that a ladle or a ladle? Whichever one of those, I forgot. A pot and the like. Even if it's made of wood or clay. Let him just observe his monetary status and all of that. Well, isn't that what one does, though? Like, normally, let's say one day he has extra money. Doesn't he, you know, he's charitable to his family. Gets them nice meal that day, for example. So, just like that. She also gets what she uses to clean and groom herself. Like a comb, soap, a laundry tub, and wudu water. And ghusl water that he caused her to need. He made her have to take that ghusl. He provides the water for her to take that ghusl. And deodorizer for herself. If she lives in a country where people like her go to the Turkish bath normally, monthly, where people like her go to the Turkish bath monthly, this is basically the spa, steamy, the steamy place. He's obligated to give her the fee for that. But not the doctor's fee. Meaning uh, her medical bills are not his obligation. If she were served in her parents' house before marrying her. Then if after marrying her she wants service that he can afford. He's obligated to hire a servant. Or to buy a slave to serve her. Whether he let her own that slave or not. And it's not enough for him to say, I'll be your servant. This will not fulfill his obligation. And then he must support that one, except in some cases. And he's obligated to pay for the midwife, the, the woman who's going to help his wife give birth. That's on him. Withholding zakah and obligatory support and salary of your employee is a major sin. Allah said in a hadith Qudsi, there are three whom I am their opponent on judgment day and whomever I were his opponent, I have defeated. A man who gave a pledge in my name, then he betrayed. A man who sold a freeman and consumed his price, like he kidnapped somebody and sold him as a slave. And a man who hired an employee, got what he wanted from him, and then did not pay him his salary. Now, still talking about giving things to people. Sometimes you give something to someone and you want it back. So if one wanted his item back, he may have deposited it with the taker to keep it safe. So then that's safekeeping. Or he may have loaned it to him to use it. <clears throat> he may have loaned it to him to use it. So then he's letting someone borrow his item and he wants it back. And he might even... Yeah, for free, Yanni. He might have loaned it to someone to use it for free. No salary attached. He can use it and then give it back. Now, if he only wanted him to keep it safe, not use it, just hold it. 
it is sunnah for the person to accept for the safekeeper it's sunnah for him to accept if he trusts himself and he is able like you might know about yourself if that, if this money gets in my possession i will spend it unrightfully then you don't accept or you might know of yourself i will not spend this money except in its proper avenues then accept it's sunnah for you not obligatory yani i'm not talking about spending money here i'm just giving you an example when you know i'm talking about when you trust yourself or you don't trust yourself you know about yourself so when you know about yourself to be untrustworthy in regards to people's properties then don't accept to help them in that you don't have to expose yourself just don't accept but if you know about yourself that you can fulfill the trusts then it's recommended to do so because that's helping someone and it's sunnah to help people in some cases it is an obligation to accept the safekeeping like if someone is unable to protect what he owns except by putting it with another who is trustworthy yeah and somebody he can't keep his stuff with him he has to either lose it or put it with someone so then you might be obligated to take it for him but then you would be entitled to request a salary a commensurate salary you'd be entitled to request how much that safekeeping is worth since you'd be obligated to take it it is forbidden to accept when one knows betrayal about himself someone says uh hold this money for me uh here this is money for the dawa not for you to spend it on yourself this is money for the dawa so if you know you're not going to spend that properly then don't take it therefore such a person must not take what he finds as already stated when we talked about lost and found now if he wanted to let the person use this item not just to hold it then either it gets consumed by usage or not if it gets consumed by usage means he's not going to get it back the way he gave it if it does get consumed by usage then this is invalid uh what's invalid here so like what first of all like a candle so someone might say what's so invalid about letting a person hold your candle and use it uh what's invalid about that is doing the deal in which the deal is that you get it back the way you gave it to him that's what's invalid when the deal is the type that you get the item back the way you gave it to him then it's not going to be valid for that item to be something consumable because you won't be able to use it so what's the point of giving it to him if he can't use it giving it to him to use it when he can't use it and if he does use it he's not going to be able to give it back to you the way you gave it to him so that's not valid what is valid though is to allow him to consume what's yours that's permissible that's a different deal you can say here you may consume this item of mine i accept for you to consume it or some of it consume as much of it as you need so if it is consumable that's going to be invalid like when renting renting requires that the item is not consumable how can you return it as it was if any of it was consumed if any of it were consumed so that's why you can't rent a candle out you can rent a house out excuse me you can't rent a pencil cuz to use it you have to consume it uh perhaps you're asking me about some wear and tear that happens naturally by using the vehicle so i haven't heard that that's matters there 
that this one will affect because it's going to be the same for an animal. If you had a horse, so if you ride it, you might tire it out. You know, it might get a nick, a scratch or something. But you can still, this is the type of thing that you can let somebody hold it to use it and then give it back to you. So I haven't heard about that you know, the brakes would get worn down, for example, every time you hit the brakes or the likes of this, that this would stop you from being able to rent the car out. In fact, you can, you definitely can rent the car out. So, But I haven't heard the details about this wear and tear that happens. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so if the item does not get consumed by usage then this is the type of deal called lending an item or borrowing an item. Not, not borrowing money to spend it and then pay it back. This is different from that. The English words are the same here. Borrow. Let me borrow your book. Let me borrow $100. Same word. Lend me your book. Lend me $100. Same word. But religiously and in Arabic, two different deals. So we have to be mindful of the words here to, distinct, to distinguish between these two cases. Uh, so we're going to call this borrowing an item or lending an item. Putting that word item in there to distinguish it from a monetary loan. Then this is lending an item we're talking about here. Giving that item for it to be used by the one who takes it and then given back to you as you gave it. One may appoint someone to retrieve it for him. So he says to you, let me borrow your such and such. And you say, okay, I accept. And then he sends someone to get it for him. That's valid. The lender of a horse must feed it. That means you have to feed your own horse. And the borrower, he must return it. He's the one who has to return the horse. The one who borrowed the horse has to return it. The one who's lending his own horse out to someone, he has to feed it. The item's benefit must be permissible. Like in renting. So it can't be haram instruments. That's not a valid lend, nor a valid rental. Some places they rent out guitars and things like that. That's invalid rental. If it is not immediately beneficial, it is a condition that the lender does not limit the deal to a time before the item becomes beneficial. You can't use it right now. It's not beneficial now. Like a young donkey. Because you can't eat it. And you can't work it because it's too small. So what good is it? You neither can eat it nor can you work it. What are you going to do with it? So it's not valid to loan something that's not beneficial and limit the time of that to that item not becoming beneficial before he has to give it back. So that's just not valid. You can't do it. If the benefit sought from the item is itself an item, the benefit from an item is another item, like the tree, its benefit could be a fruit. The cow, its benefit might be milk. So what's the judgment here? If the benefit sought from the item is itself another item, not a mere trace or effect. Not like in the case of the horse, the benefit is riding it. It's not an item, an object. So an object like the milk of the cow or the fruit of the tree. Then how do you do that? Then the lender lends the cow and permits him to consume the milk. This is valid by consensus. This scenario I just told you, that's valid by consensus. You loan the person the, f uh, the initial item and allow him to consume any objects that come from that. 
That's valid by consensus. It was said that he can loan the cow, granting him the right to benefit from what it produces. Some said this is invalid because the actual borrowed thing would be the consumed milk. Uh, so you might say, well, what's the difference here? The difference is we're talking about the fact that this type of deal requires that you return the item the way you got it. It can't be consumable. So if you're borrowing the cow for the milk, then it's as if, according to some, it's as if you're really just borrowing the milk. You don't want the cow. You want the milk. You don't want the tree. You want the fruit. But this type of deal only accommodates something that's not consumable. So how are you going to get the cow and the milk or the tree and the fruit? So by consensus, it's valid to allow the person to um, borrow the cow or the tree and permit him to consume the objects that come from them. Some said, if you did borrow the tree or the cow, then consuming the fruit or the milk just comes along with it anyway. Some said, but if you want to be very exact, those are two different things. You could say to a person, you can borrow my cow, but you can't take the milk. I don't want you to take the milk. Or you can borrow the tree, but you can't take the fruit. So others are saying, no, it doesn't just automatically come along that if you get the cow, you get the milk. If you get the tree, you get the fruit. It's not automatic. Rather, you can borrow the cow or the tree and be permitted to consume what comes from it. If a time limit is not specified, the borrower, the borrower may normally use the item once. So someone loans you a book and doesn't tell you when you have to give it back. That's not a permission to keep it until you die. Like some people would do. Rather, the rule is you use it once. So read the book and then you give it back. In a normal way. Not twice. Don't read the book twice here. Because you weren't given a time limit. So since you weren't given a time limit, the rule is use the item normally once and then give it back. Imagine a person, he says, can I borrow your bike? So you say, sure. Let's say it's nine in the morning. Say, can I borrow your bike? You say, sure. Then he comes back nine at night. He says, where you been? What's going on here? So you let me borrow the bike. But I didn't tell you you can borrow for 12 hours. So you didn't tell me when. So, so you can see where the issue is here. Use it once normally and then bring it back. If a time limit is specified, then one may use the item repeatedly until the expiration. Wallahu a'lam. Let's stop there. <laughs>